I guess the first thing I would say is, is uh, I think the, you know, the Occupy thing has totally changed the conversation about inequality for the better. I think it's not because people weren't aware that there were these growing inequalities. I think that people looked at them and thought, there's nothing we can do about them. And I think the fact that there's now a sense, a framework that people can position themselves. I'm in the 99%. Here's the 1% is a way that people can tell a story about what's happened to themselves uh, that gives them a sense of it's not just their individual struggle or individual limits. So when you read that those stories, you know, I go on the website every couple of days, just read the I we are the ninety nine percent stories, you realize that people who have who in another social context might be blaming themselves for taking on $80,000 in student loans and not being able to find a job that pays more than $9 an hour, are seeing that, seeing their individual story in the, that larger context. And that lens, and, but, and, and kind of jumping ahead to John's question, that isn't going to go away. The, 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 the growing number of people who are going to see their own experience, that whether it's the collapsing middle class, persistent poverty, the inability to kind of get ahead, that's not going away. The pressure is just going to keep building. Uh, and to the extent that the 99 to 1 lens, I think is powerful in terms of that going forward. So we could talk more about that. But just starting, I would say that the most important, one of the things that I think this, the conversation we want to keep rolling is that these inequalities matter. That the extreme inequalities that have emerged in the last 30 years affect, ev undermine everything we care about. So just like, close your eyes and think of what's three things that you care about. You care about kids, you care about school, you care about health, you care about the environment and the earth, you care about sports. Everything you care about has been wrecked by these extreme inequalities. And so that's the story that I think we just kind of keep keep talking about. You you care about your happiness. You care about what the built environment is around you when you walk down the street. Is it a welcoming environment? Is the park an inviting place? The, the structure, the built environments, all are reflections of these inequalities. Um, so I think that's part of the story. And, and uh, Richard Wilkinson's book, The Spirit Level, I think kind of speaks to that. Not just uh, health care. We're all better off living in a more equal society. Even the 1% is going to live longer and healthier in a society with less extreme inequality. So I think that, you know, is part of the truth and part of the story. The, the, when it comes to the talking about the economy and the transition, so the people in this group at this table have been sitting around talking about how do we make a transition from this, the old dinosaur fossil fuel economy that's completely unsustainable to a new economy what does it look like? What's the framework? These inequalities are central. I mean, we, you cannot have a healthy transition to a new economy with the, anything approaching the levels of inequality that we have. It's just not possible for, for a number of reasons. One is just that extreme inequality just continues to undermine real healthy economic activity. Uh, so. I think there's a story about the economic meltdown in 2008, which is sort of getting out there. I think Bob Reich has told that story. I think the Occupy movement is telling the story that inequality crashed the economy. Inequality, too much unequal wealth, is one of the sort of causes. It's not just sort of a, an after effect. It's a cause of the economic um, crash. And simply put, when the bottom 99%, or really really the bottom 70%, has had stagnant or flat or falling wages for 30 years, how are people surviving? They're working more hours and they're borrowing. So we had consumption, particularly the last 10 years before the economic meltdown, consumption based on people borrowing, not based on their real wages growing up, going up. People were borrowing to maintain a standard of living, to hold it together to survive. And that was not sustainable. When the, when, the, when the mortgage bubble burst and the easy access to credit seized up, it seized up all across the economy because people were depending on borrowing 
to survive. That piece of the story, I think, is told. But the other part of the story is what was happening with the 1%. 2007, the 1% had estimated over a third of all the private wealth in the United States, about $20 trillion of wealth held by the 1%. Some of that was in real estate and property and real investments in the real economy. But more and more of that $20 trillion was moving into the, uh, the high-risk, high-return sector of the economy, the shadow banking system, the gambling dens, placing more and more bets. Rich people have investment advisors. And those investment advisors are saying, great, you know, uh, Karen Dolan, take, take some of your $200 million in wealth over there and invest some of that in your stable investments that will always, you'll always be wealthy and you can always hedge against downturn. But hey, let's take half of your 200 million and let's, let's put some in the, let's get something interesting going on here, the 20% the, the, the returns, the 15% returns on investment. And so a huge percentage of that 20 trillion moved from, the, from investments in the real economy into the betting economy and combine that with the sovereign wealth funds and combine that with the corporate cash that's sitting around at AIG, all of a sudden you have a huge demand for deals, pushing money down from the 1% into the real economy and preying and predatory lending on the real economy. So you put together the speculation at the top with the collapsing wages of the middle and the bottom, and you have a recipe for huge economic instability. So there's a story to be told. We can't have a healthy economy with extreme inequalities. It doesn't, it doesn't work. You know, the reason that we grew together in the 30 years after World War II is real wages actually did grow up, go up, that there was an expansion in shared prosperity of the middle class, and that uh, drove a whole level of uh, healthy growth. Here's the thing. We can't, that recipe is over. We're not going back to the 1950s, 60s, 70s recipe for shared prosperity because for because of ecological limits so now we have to come up with a whole new recipe for how shared prosperity happens and the final thing i'll say is as long as the one percent not only holds huge amount of the the wealth of the economy globally and and in the u.s economy but they also have huge amounts of power wealth is power they have the power to block change and that's where the segment of the 1% the, the that I think is, are the culprits are what I would call the rule riggers within the 1%. There's a lot of allies in the 1% who want to see an economy work for the 100%, our patriotic millionaires, the wealth for the common good networks. But there's a segment of that 1% that are using their wealth and power to selfishly expand their wealth and power, to rig the rules of the game so that the economy works for the 1% and not the 99%. Those are the people that we need to protect ourselves from and retake the economy and retake the politics so that the economy works for everybody. But as long as we have these extreme concentration of power, they are going to block the transition that we need to take, the need to make, to the new economy. Uh, somebody needs to go on mute there. So we can't get there. And I'm going to talk a little bit about how the, the, uh, the, the revenue system, the tax system, how it's organized to benefit the 1% is blocking the transition to the ecological and economic policies we need to really make the transition to the new economy. Um, but when 1% has so much power, and uh, then they're standing, they're blocking the doorway, and we can push and push, uh, but we need to address directly the concentrations of wealth. So maybe I'll stop there. Um, and we'll talk later about what does that revenue system look like.